Thank you very much, Mark. You're all very welcome. Um, it's, it's great to be here um, on the, the, the first of my first Wednesday debates and uh, I look forward to coming back for some more. It sounds like you've had some very interesting ones in the past. So um, thank you very much for having me along to moderate. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, Super, okay. So um, I'd just like to first of all just introduce the, the, the panel to you and then we'll kick off the discussions. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the gentleman who's travelled the furthest to be here. Um, so to my left here, um, Jose Omar Rodriguez uh, Romero, also known, known to his friends, apparently it's Omar, so I'm going to make that presumption that I can, that I can call you Omar as your friend today. Um, so Omar has, um, has travelled today all the way from Honduras. He's a fourth generation coffee producer in the village of Capucas, is, is that, am I pronouncing it correctly? In uh, San Pedro de Copan, and where he leads the Limited Coffee Cooperative of Capucas, um, or known as Coco? Cocafcal. Okay, so um, Omar took over from his father um, and um, under his leadership has expanded um, the the output of the co-op really very dramatically from uh, 20,000 bags of coffee and annually to um, 170,000 bags. Um, so, and he's done that, we'll, we'll tease out some of the, the, the ways that he's gone about doing that. Um, but maybe, Omar, you would just tell us a little bit about some of the, the practices that you introduced. Um, I believe um, you, you, you focused on um, the quality of the coffee and on using things like solar drying um, and micro lots of, of the coffee. Maybe just tell us a little bit about some of the production practices that you introduced for the co-op. So, yes, please. Good night. Thank you. Uh, um, it's the first time that I have this uh, this kind of conversation, but uh, um, very happy to be here and very glad that uh, Fair Trade invited me uh, to your beautiful country. Um, uh, the weather is not a problem. <laughs> 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 Everybody complains about the weather, so no, no. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and know more about uh, your country and, o and of course to understand more the coffee market here in uh, in Ireland. Uh, for us as a producer, it's, it's very important to to understand that and also how, I mean, all the effort that you make for uh, teach the, the young people. In, in the morning, we was in a in a in a school, uh, and we see all the pictures that the kids was making, uh, trying to learn about fair trade. That fair trade helped farmers. So uh, for us. Uh, um, make me have a more commitment with the system to protect more the system and trying to to keep this system alive so um and also i mean the towns of fairtrade and everything so but uh to answer the the question uh what was the question so i just wanted to ask you i, I will come shortly to to the to the differences that this fair trade certification made but first of all you introduced mm -hmm. some other um practices in in the coffee production mm -hmm. such as solar drying mm -hmm. um maybe just tell us a little bit about some of yeah. the the practices that you introduced to mm -hmm. improve production of yeah. the coffee yeah i have to be i have to be honest that uh, it's not easy work with the with the farmers i mean it's a it's a hard uh, thing to to teach them that uh, things are not doing only because money, because uh, I mean, the first thing that they think is, okay, how much shall we win? Which is normal. I mean, we have a lot of problems. So then uh, it's normal that you think, okay, if I am uh, doing this different in my farm, so how much shall we earn? How much money you will give me for that? So, but now with the time, because we begin in, uh, in 99 with the co-op, and uh, we start with certifications, trying to apply the standards. You know, these standards sometimes are very hard for the producer to to uh, 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 to work on that. But um, but in the beginning, I remember that uh, uh, when we start with the certification, they was okay. You know, we have to change this to improve the the house of the workers. To put a toilet in the middle of the farm if they don't have a, a house near of the farm. So a lot of rules to protect the water. So many things that they feel that is more like okay rules, you know. And and and, and the human beings we don't like rules. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody want to live uh, uh, free. So uh, but uh, with the time we see that now the farmers understand that when they put a, a wood tree in a farm. 
is to you know to prevent uh, all this uh, change that we now have i mean that we have now in the in the climate and the weather so that uh, we have to protect the water that we have to i mean to use all that waste that we have for in coffee to understand 100% of the coffee that uh, of the fruit 80% is waste i mean 80% is pulp is mucilage honey water so a lot of waste that we can we have to use as an organic to to put again to the farm so that's what we're trying to to change so we are we was working on that or we and obviously the, the the fact that you have increased your your output um is shows that there that by investing in this way you can actually Im improve the 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 incomes yeah. um how many how many farmers are are members now? I know there was fifty five when when you first took over fifty five local members. Um, would it be similar or has the membership increased? No, we we grow now. We are a little bit more than one thousand uh, farmers. Right. And uh, all That's the farmers are thirty five. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm just something I'm going to ask each of the speakers um, to to um, to give us their vision. In if I was to ask you in two, three, four words, what your vision would be for the future of food. What comes to mind for you? Uh, first, I think uh, fair trade, organic. For me, that's that's the future. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, super. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Omar. I'd like to move to, to Rose, um, if I could, please. Um, and the reason I suppose I'm mov moving to Rose, um, Rose is, is, is Irish and has not travelled from um, Honduras today, but Rose did spend um, many years of her career. Um, she's had a 30-year career in rural development and 17 of those were in Tanzania and Uganda. Sorry, Rose Hogan, I should have introduced her fully as. Um, Rose is, is a uh, crop scientist um, and she's um, worked in areas um, in in, in, in the field in Tanzania and Uganda in areas such as agroforestry, integrated rural development, um, environment planning and management and, and in, um, environmental education. Um, currently, Rose uh, works um, in for an international NGO promoting agroecology um, whilst also maintaining a native woodland and garden in South Galway. Rose, you might just tell us... Um, I think you ha should have a mic microphone there. Um, you might just tell us a little bit about what agroecology is, and um, and perhaps just s some of um, of of what you, the, what you're looking at in that area. Great. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm a bit nervous about doing this, the first time, and uh, I don't really come to the political sort of scene in Ireland, though. About 30 years ago, I was involved with COLOV as well on outreach education programs and the bringing it all back home that our beloved uh, Dimnamini was involved with. So, yeah, it's great to be back and uh, to be invited to um, converse with you all this evening. Agroecology, I'm, I don't know whether people in the audience um, have thought about it or know about it, but it's basically using the principles of ecology to do our agriculture. And the whole idea is based on the question of how can we become more sustainable. And the closer you get in the situation you're in, you know, the agroecological zone, whether it's temperate or tropical, or whether you're up in the highlands or down in the lowlands, the closer you can get to the way nature is working, naturally, the more sustainable you're going to be, the more efficient you're going to be. So things like what Omar is saying about rounding up the waste and putting it back into the system, that's what we're talking about. A circular system rather than a linear system where all your, your energy, your water is all getting exported and you're ending up a poor rural person and you know maybe ending up with a bankrupt uh, piece of land because it's not able to grow anything anymore and you end up in a slum or you know an urban slum. So that's, is that enough to say Absolutely. about agriculture? Um, what's the, oh, sorry, what's the name of the NGO that, that you're working Well, it with? happens to be Trocra, and <laughs> at the moment I've worked for several organisations, um, but it's Trocra now, mm -hmm. and um, it's actually been a wonderful experience um, of being the first uh, sustainable agriculturalist to work for Trocra globally and to help Trocra to decide what approach it wanted to take and happily after three years they've listened to my sermons and taken it on board and they're the first Irish international development NGO to take it on board and Omar was just saying I haven't ever met him before but uh, Trocra does work in Honduras and it was there at the beginning of the formation of cooperatives there and um, I don't know much about 
that history because I'm new to Trocra, but yeah, that, okay. that's where I'm at now. Super. So, yeah. And if I was to ask you the same question, if you had two, three, four words to describe your vision of the future of food, what would they be? Mm-hmm. I don't know how realistic it is, but it's my passion and my dream that it would be self-sufficient, um, wholesome, but wholesome in t- nutritionally and ho- wholesome metaphorically in that it it's fair and just and locally owned. Okay, that's that's a, an interesting kind of key uh, addition there at the end. Um, and, we'll, and we'll come back to, to some of that and kind of looking at the idea of food sovereignty and, and the kind of shift to, to that way of thinking. I should also just mention that Rose um, has uh, performed organic crops research in Ireland and also contributed to the establishment of an EU-recognised organic certificate, certification system and body. Um, so again, we'll come back to, to looking at, at, at that as well in the kind of global context as well. Um, but um, perhaps I could move to, to Norman. Um, so Norman here uh, beside me has been general manager of the, um, if you'd like to take the microphone there, has been general manager of the Dublin Food Co-op, which many of you will be familiar with, um, since uh, December uh, 2012, and previously worked uh, throughout the cooperative movement in the UK. Um, he's been a member of the Whole Food Worker Co-op and spent two years in rural Zimbabwe working with cooperatives there. So he has both the kind of local, local and global um, perspective. Um, he's also a member of the Plunkett Foundation Task Force, advising on the development of Plunkett Ireland to support rural communities. Um, you might just tell us, tell us a little bit about that, about the, Plun- the Plunkett Foundation um, and, and what, what that does to, in its support of rural communities? Uh, yes, well, um, Horace Plunkett was a famous cooperator. Most of the agricultural cooperatives in Ireland were set up as a result of the efforts of Horace Plunkett and, and his colleagues in the late 19th century. Um, he was very committed uh, to it. Um, but he was also a unionist politician, so during the Civil War, um, some people came round to his house and burnt it. So he moved to to England, to near Oxfordshire, and he set up the Plunkett Foundation to promote the principles of agricultural cooperation in local care communities worldwide. And so his philosophy was based on three... um, planks or three um, beliefs. Better cooperatives, better uh, better trade, better cooperatives, better communities. Also, better better cooperatives, better communities, better living. So it was a progression that the better living was the end, but cooperatives were the beginning. And the Plunkett Foundation has been in the UK and internationally promoting cooperatives worldwide. Um, but the current um, chief executive there is a, a personal friend of mine, Peter Couchman, and he is very, he's a, probably a world expert on Horace Plunkett. He's a bit of a, um, uh, a geek cooperator. Um, and he's very interested in bringing the Plunkett Foundation and the Plunkett philosophy back to where it started in rural Ireland. So we're working on establishing the Plunkett Foundation in Ireland. We're currently working in Tipperary uh, in conjunction with Clock Jordan, in conjunction with North Tipperary Leader. And we're hoping to spread it out where nationwide. Okay, interesting. And then, of course, the, the cooperative, uh, the, the Dublin Food Co-op, um, which has been in existence, would I be right in saying 20 or 25 years? Or is it, is 33. it 33, well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> it just shows you how much um, something um, feels feels like it's it's quite modern, but it's been around for an extraordinary long time. Um, and, and that has, has changed um, quite significantly in that time. Um, how would you dis- describe the Dublin, Co-op, Dublin Food Co-op to, if anyone here isn't familiar with it? It was set up um, 33 years ago by a group of people who had been involved with the anti-nuclear campaign at Consul Point. And when that ended, it was, OK, what next? <laughs> We've won that one. Um, let's move on to another battle. And they decided the next battle was about food, in particular the problem of having vegetarian food, of having organic food, of having fair trade food. So we were set up on that basis uh, a handful of members originally, um, small 
pop-up shops around Temple Bar and North Dublin in King Street. And for many years, we were at uh, St Andrew's Centre in Pier Street. Uh, eight, nine years ago, we moved to our present premises in Newmarket, where we've been able to expand. And they got to the stage where they could afford a manager again. And when I arrived, sort of turnover was 700,000. It's now, this year, going to go through a million. Um, we had 800 members, we've now 1,700. So we're, we're growing, and the more we grow, the more people become aware, the more people become attracted to what we um, provide. And interestingly enough, sort of um, back in the referendum, so the, refer the referendum last year wasn't won by all the gay people coming out and voting, although they did. It was won by all the people that weren't gay voting for gay rights. And in a similar way, Dublin Food Corp, two-thirds of our membership are meat eaters. But mm. two-thirds of our membership support the very vegetarian principle of the co-op. So a third of our membership are meat eaters who support the vegetarian principle and want to keep it going, even if it's not basically in their interests. I think that's an important part of the cooperative message um, is solidarity and solidarity with producers in developing countries, solidarity with people who aren't the same as you but whose aims you don't want to see um, eliminated. I think that's a very important principle. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question. If you have Two, two, three, four words to describe your vision of the future of food. What would it be? What would they be? Uh, local, fresh and owned by people, not corporations. OK, so again, that question of ownership um, is an interesting one. Um, well, thank you very much, Norman. Um, I'd like to move to, to Ross Golden Bannon. Um, Ross has, um, interestingly that you should mention the, the recent referendum, um, Ross has campaigned in Britain and Ireland for LGBT civil rights for many years um, and was a board member of Marriage Equality for the past 10 years, which obviously resulted in the fantastic referendum victory of 2015. Um, he's committed to a change in the dominant food and agricultural thinking to policies of integrity and stewardship for lifelong health. He is um, a co-member of the Irish Food Writers Guild with, with me um, and was rapporteur for the uh, our recent white paper that we produced um, called The Health of the Nation, uh, where we, we looked at uh, areas that we as a Food Writers Guild would like to tackle um, in terms of the future of food. Um, and he's currently standing um, as independent candidate for the sh upcoming Shannon elections on the NUI panel um, and believes that sustainability and social justice should not be a democratic afterthought but part of its very machinery. Um, Ross, what maybe you just tell us a, um, about just briefly kind of name some of the areas that you feel as senator, um, if you were to be elected, that you would really like to address in terms of um, some of the, the, the main kind of food concerns, food issues that you have. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting, I mean, we have a long um, tradition of independent voices in both the Doyle and the Senate in actually delivering on, on some change in a wide range of areas. Um, if some of you may remember Sean Dublin Bay Loftus, we would have an oil refinery in Dublin Bay if it weren't for him. And then more recently, people like Avril Power who did such fantastic work around adoption rights as well. So, you know, the idea, idea that as an independent that you wouldn't have a voice, I think, is wrong. I do think that um, a, a, as a non-party representative that you can raise issues that party members are afraid, possibly, uh, to raise. Um, in particular, I just feel there's a, there is a number of issues which I, I figure a lot of people here will recognise there are a number of issues that the general mainstream media just don't report on because they tend to curve around the debates and issues that the uh, establishment are interested in. So when you want to try and curve them away from that and get them to talk about issues that are uh, deeply related to the functioning of the state, it's extremely difficult. I think a platform in the Senate kind of gives you that extra edge in getting those uh, issues uh, on, the on, on the national um, debate. The key issue for me is, and it's kind of really basic, uh, 
all of the discourse around our health service at the moment is about how how much more we need to spend, how much more we're going to spend next year, who's going to spend more than the next person, how we're going to get help all these really sick people. And not a single mainstream party has said, why don't we look upstream? Why are all these people falling in in the first place? All we are doing is lifting them out of the water instead of looking upstream and finding out why they're getting sick in the first place. And this is a very interesting and basic fact. For the first time in Western uh, human history, we are no longer, uh, pathogens are no, is no longer the biggest killer. The biggest killer is now diet. That is what is killing us. Now, no post-war government would have hesitated for a moment in intervening in the state to bring, to bring about change in that, to stop people getting sick and to make sure that they didn't end up in hospitals. But, unfortunately, all of the mainstream, most of the mainstream parties are committed to an ideology that means that they won't intervene in the state and the food supply in the necessary way in order to bring about change in health outcomes. So that was a kind of a very basic view that I had around the food supply that had me, like a serious principle there that had me really quite agitated. And then we had a an expert in uh, perinatal uh, d uh, nutrition came to speak to the Irish Food Writers Guild and what she had to share with us was really quite horrifying. Um, for, again, for the first time, there are now a new generation of children who are being born into families. Uh, they are already uh, malnourished. When they are born, they are malnourished. And what has happened is the, their fe the fetus, because the mother is malnourished, and these people often do not look skinny. You know, the image is that if you're malnourished, you're skinny, but that's not. The, they're malnourished, they're on poor diets, and what happens is the fetus behaves in a certain way. It prioritizes the brain. That's the most important thing for the human is the brain. They prioritize the brain and excludes all the other major organs. Just gives them a minimum amount of nutrition. Um, so when the child is born, it is already set up with... Uh, problems with their major organs. So even if the child has the best diet for the rest of their life, and they, they're fit and healthy and play sports, they've already got a compromised major organ system. So they've uh, a lifetime of ill health ahead of them. So we were absolutely horrified when we heard this. This is the case in the UK, across the United, United States as well, and, and, and also in Ireland. And really... It's that combined with those other things that I mentioned that made me feel like I really, really need to take a lot more action and hopefully persuade government to intervene in the growing production and consumption of food in Ireland. Great. And again, I'm just going to put that question to you. If you had three, four words to describe your vision of the future of food, what would they be? Um, I just since you were saying that, I just have a horror vision of the future <laughs> of food. So I, I have to try and think it's a little bit more positive. Um, I mean, the well, thing is, a, everyone else has been quite positive. So yes, you can I give know. us the, the, okay. the horror story if you like. <laughs> no, I mean the thing is, if we don't spend it on the plate, we spend it at the doctor or the dentist, and that is true of the individual as it is of the state. So unless we bring and so the positive image is that the state does decide to intervene and that we end up with much more positive food policies that would encompass education from childhood all the way through to adulthood, which means that people have a healthier diet and people start viewing food as medicine and not just fuel. Okay, that, that, uh, that was more than three or four words, but we'll give it to you. We'll give it to you nonetheless. Um, I'd like to just um, to put to start looking at um, w one of the first kind of questions that we'll address today. And I suppose, given that this is part of the Fair Trade Fortnight, I thought it might be useful to to just look backwards a little bit first before we look forwards, um, and to think about um, what progress has been made with fair trade and where are the future shifts in thinking that need to be made that were similar because if you think about you know 20 years ago when the idea of fair trade was was a very revolutionary idea for us that oh yeah to actually think about where that money is going and is it going to the farmer and could I make choices as a consumer that will that will affect the you know um the 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 the, the lives of of those people growing goods for me um so Omar, one of the things that you introduced um, in your co-op was was eight certifications, including yeah. fair trade. And um, what positive changes have you seen fair trade bring to your community? And 
another part of that question is maybe you just tell us a little bit about the vulnerability that the community faced um, in face with the price fluctuations when it's not protected by fair trade. Mm -hmm. Yes, but well, uh, this is um, one of the one of the biggest thing of fair trade is that protection that give to the farmers in terms of the price. So that uh, permit that uh, we as a community can planify the future, saying, okay, I I have uh, let's say ten containers that will sell to Ireland, and for this price, so I can planify it uh, with that, you know, like a flow cash and. <coughs> And then the administration part, but also uh, the premium that we receive from fair trade, also in the social programs that we have. <coughs> so uh, uh, basically, give us that uh, that base that to to permit to us to planify the future and to planify it, uh, with the with all the members uh, what uh, programs or what uh, um, social programs we will support for this year. So uh, that's why now we are supporting the health education, uh, diversification, which is very important for us because, uh, I mean, the, the farmers cannot uh, alive only with coffee. They have to produce a anything else, I mean, and other things. Uh, that's why we are now growing lemongrass, passion fruit, uh, tomatoes uh, to sell in the internal. All, all, all the things thinking to, uh, to the external market, trying to export, to get the the value uh, of that product not just saying okay i will produce to eat which is good because it's important but also to trying to make the same that we did with coffee trying to also certify that products and trying to sell in the market so to give extra incomes and um i think one of the biggest enemies that we have uh, that we face is uh, the transnationals the transnationals they they, I think, in the beginning, they don't see the the potential of this uh, the, this system, but now they look at us as uh, enemies. So everybody is saying uh, outside, like, okay, fair trade is not good, is not good, is not a good job. So they trying to make noise here in this market, and also they transmit that idea to us, saying, you know, uh, people in, in in Europe is thinking that fair trade is not good, so they don't want fair trade. But this is the traders. When I came here and see. Uh, people working very hard to promote fair trade, and I see that the sellers of fair trade is growing. So I see so something is wrong here. So somebody is lying about the, this. So basically, they trying to destroy the system. And we have now an example of Nicaragua, which is very sad that uh, they destroy six cooperatives. They just write the price because they are transnational. They lose money inside. For for them, is better because they don't pay tax. But they moved the, all the money to S Switzerland, and uh, and uh, that's it. And they lose money in Nicaragua, but win money in, in Europe. And nobody knows about that. So in the end, it's very easy for them. They rise the price. Let's say that a differential for fair trade, uh, fair trade coffee, fair trade or I mean uh, an organic fair trade coffee, is fifty dollars. So they rise to sixty, and then cooperatives cannot compete. And then the members that see that that price, they don't. That's why it's very important to have the commitment of the farmers to be part of the co-op, not just for money. That's important to transmit that message that this is, this is not a thing only for money. It's a thing to a social programs and also for safe security. So uh, they raise the price, and all the cooperatives cannot afford all the containers, so they broke. Now they they had they control the marketing in Nicaragua. So in in, in Honduras, it happened the same. We have a good coffee, they know that, but uh, they transport the coffee from Honduras to Guatemala because here people know more about Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Colombia. And they say, you know, nobody knows about Honduras, so uh, the price is this. So they're trying to get as cheap as they, they can the coffee, but then they can sell the coffee here as a Colombian coffee because, I mean, the consumer cannot distinct uh, between a Colombia or Honduran coffee. So in the end, you know, th that's the importance of, uh, that's why now I learn a lot in this trip when I see people uh, that support uh, a community, a name, an origin. That's very important also. So, uh, you know, we have a fair trade organic coffee and also but an origin. That's very important and also in the legislation part in the country that we have to protect that origin that in the end will help also to the farmers that uh, grow that coffee. 
And now that people um, are are more aware of their the origin of their coffee as well, yeah. that's something people want the the backstory as well and want to know where something is coming from. Um, Rose, I might just bring you in um, just w- with your experience on the ground in Uganda and Tanzania would you have any observations about the kind of vulnerability that communities face with this kind of price fluctuation um, when they're dealing with commodities like have you first hand experience of, of having seen that kind of vulnerability mm-hmm. um, well you have situations where uh, there's hunger and do you have the microphone there oh, sorry <laughs> You have situations internally where there may be hunger in in the the country, and um, the demand then for say maize in the city markets increases because people are buying up that food and taking it to the the hungry areas. Uh, so the city people aren't able to buy food, and prices just go up and up. Um, and um, then you have other situations, of course, where subsidised foods are coming in. And somebody made the link recently um, around subsidised foods coming into Kenya and um, offering it at cheaper prices than the farmers could afford to grow it at. Mm-hmm. And so um, compromising the farmers' uh, opportunities to make profit or even um, cut a balance in the market. Yeah. Um, yeah, but th- I, I mean, I suppose I have a, a question here as well, um, um, because it's always something that arises in, in the work I do now as well. And it's we've supported um, poor farmers um, and like looking for the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, usually in the furthest away mountain <laughs> um, in, in whatever country or and um, supported them to get into value addition and into into markets. And um, in some cases, we've been extremely successful. And so these people actually end up being the wealthy ones. And so you have to do another round then of identification where you go back again and you, you've got to find the people on the base. But I think unless you're doing something like Omar is talking about, where you're not um, totally dependent on one product mm-hmm. and that the one product is for export, uh, you need to be careful around um, exposing people to the markets and so I suppose that's why uh, I um, hang on this self-sufficiency term uh, because I, I think um, uh, we, we have to move away from I don't know if you're familiar with development dialogues that go on about uh, graduating farmers from subsistence to commercialization and yeah I mean it's an absolute chestnut um, that horrifies me and uh, the term subsistence I think is terribly derogatory uh, so the idea is that if people are selling stuff well then they you know they've arrived but actually there are plenty of um, academic uh, studies that show that um, being commercial doesn't necessarily give a person a better diet or a better standard of living so I you know I just think there's mm. that aspect of it to be thought about as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, and I think I'd like to move uh, shortly to, to look at kind of that idea of food sovereignty as opposed to food security, and so to food sovereignty that, that takes in those kind of aspects. Um, I'd just like to stay with fair trade for a minute. Norman, um, is is this something that presumably um, fair trade, so so the, the, the co-op has been around for 33 years, and presumably fair trade was something that, that was embraced by the co-op. Are people still loyal to, to fair trade, or are there other um, concerns that have... That have moved in 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 its place. Um, could I come to that? So I was yes. really interested in something that Omar said. Is there anybody in here from Donegal? No. No. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, up in Donegal is a famous character around the same time as Horace Plunkett called Paddy the Cope. Uh, Paddy the Cope Gallagher, I think his name Gallagher, was. Yeah. His um, his grandson is a. TD at the minute, it's just been returned. Um, but Paddy the Cope had similar issues with the Gombean men and the, the traders in Donegal, because the, the small farmers in the west of Ireland, one of the reasons they turned to corpse was precisely because of the um, the way they were being exploited by the middlemen and the land agents and the Gombean men, and etc. Et and basically, Paddy the Cope turned the tactics of the buy, of the middlemen, the buyers, back on them. So, for example, they were offering a very good price for eggs. So the co-op 
would buy the eggs from the farmers and then through one of the farmers acting as a front would sell the eggs to the Gombean men for the, the higher price. They would then divide the money among themselves and then next week it would happen again. And there were all sorts of tactics like that. So while you're in Ireland, take a trip up to Donegal <laughs> <laughs> because there's not much um, Irish people don't know about getting finding their way around exploitation. So. <laughs> But um, to come to back, back to the yeah, so to would, come back would to the question, still be a, a, a core principle. Oh, ab- absolutely. Um, our, our main issue at the moment is China, and we're looking at um, how we reduce imports from China. Um, our policy is not to boycott any particular country. Our policy is to favour countries with positive human rights. But there's a, a large number of our members who now think we should be taking positive action against certain countries. So we're trying to find a way of measuring that. We're looking at the Human Rights Index. We're looking at you know, um, human rights organisations. There's a, a red, amber and green classification system for human rights. I think um, one of the third world... Um, third world first, is it? Um, there's a development organisation that classifies countries according to that system. So what we need is a, a simple system which says, yep, we deal with these. We only deal with these if we're convinced of the bona fides of the particular company and supplier, and this country is a complete red line. Um, it's difficult because we have to find alternative suppliers, but I get pressure from our members to, to look for those suppliers. I have um, wholesalers come into the office and I say, OK, have you found any non-Chinese pumpkin seeds yet? You know, and we're having those sorts of conversations on a, a regular basis. So, yes, it's very much a concern. OK. Um, and Ross, um, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on... Um, whether we can learn something um, in terms of our own kind of home production of food from fair trade. We, you know, we think of fair trade as, you know, coffee producers, chocolate producers and so on um, and giving a fair price and so on to the to farmers, you know, on the other side of the world. But then you you look at, for example, today we, uh, myself and Ross, were at the Irish Food Writers Guild Awards and we had um, Mossfield Milk, um, a milk producer of 33 years who 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 went organic and, and moved away from that commodification and you see the the milk producers the dairy producers uh, dairy farmers you know really um on their knees so it's just a, is it something that we can learn um in in Ireland from that certifi- certificate yeah, that does, system yeah there does seem to be a little bit of a common theme there of people being forced into single production and once you get trapped into that cycle, it's nearly like a drug, you know, and then you have to ramp up your production. Then you invest in high end dairy processing and, you know, you're already on the international market then. And, you know, so then you'll buy up the neighbor's farm. And, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I, the diversification in farming has so many benefits beyond just being helpful to the business as well. I think then that people can then step outside that trap of getting into single produce production and exporting at that level. Um, Unfortunately, we're a very strange country in many ways around food production because um, our produce is considered by chefs in mainland Europe amongst the absolute best in Europe. We have the cleanest soil in in Europe. We never had an industrial revolution. French chefs are and Spanish and Italian chefs are in awe of the produce here. They're always talking to each other amongst each other about when they've been to Ireland, the produce they got and the way that they could cook with it. But then the tradition just kind of seems to be truncated and it hasn't made its way into the general population. Um, 80% of seafood in Killy Bags, as soon as it's landed, it's frozen, shipped out of the country. Um, you don't. It's not, you're not going to find it uh, on on plates in Ireland. So we have a real, real issue around our food culture, um, which goes back generations, and it, it would be hard to break that. If you, it's you know, an interest in good food and quality food is seen as a bourgeois thing. It's elitist. Um, whereas if you are in Italy or Spain, people have an interest and a knowledge of their local food and lo- local produce uh, 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 right 
all the way across classes. It, it doesn't matter where you come from in society. You have an interest and an in-depth knowledge of your local food and, your, and the local production and a loyalty to it that really only compares to GAA county loyalty in Ireland. Like, that's really how it translates. And we just don't have that. And it's... Uh, you know, it, it would take a long time to bring that back. It would be, you know, it'd be a twenty-year process to do that. Um, I'm not sure if that necessarily answers the question around trade. I mean, for for, uh, I mean, the flip side uh, of fair trade, I suppose, to me, is TTIP and CETA, um, and the transatlantic trade and investment partnership is a, I'm sure lots of people here have heard about it, but maybe just, to, it, would it be okay just to give a bit of a, or do you want to come back to that later? Well, I'll tell you what, we might we might come back to that sure, um, sure. shortly, but it leads us in nicely to just the, the question I wanted to kind of tease out a little bit about kind of food security and food sovereignty. I wonder, would anyone like to, to explain the difference um, between food security and food sovereignty and that kind of shift in, in thinking? Norman, would you be up for the job? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, food security comes out of um, sort of humanitarian thinking and it's around ensuring that people have enough to eat. And it's usually not actually even nutrition security. It's actually just food. And it was um, very calorie centred. If someone else knows more about this in the audience, please, please um, add on. Um, whereas food sovereignty is is a movement that has come out of um, peasant farming in Central America, um, the um, Campesina to Campesina movement, and um, its its um, main um, promoters are um, all members of La Via Campesina, which is an international movement for uh, small scale farmers. Sometimes in Ireland, we people think peasant is a derogatory term, but uh, I don't think that way at all. Um, and uh, actually, just one one little quip there around um, pride in farming and and pride in in land ownership and land stewardship. I think it's starting to come back in Ireland. Um, uh, when I was a child on a farm in North Tipperary, um, it was greatest shame on earth to um, go to town uh, in your summer dress and let someone see the welly mark on your legs and but now I think you know people buy posh wellies from this guy in Cabotili <laughs> on a website you know uh, they're pink they're every color um, and and a lot of young people want to study agriculture I mean the sad thing about it is that that the Irish system has uh, run down its um, numbers of uh, agricultural colleges and and uh, teachers. Um, so yeah, um, so that's really the difference. And and food sovereignty is about people owning um, everything to do with food from the field to the plate and back again. Um, so it's it's a rights based approach to food and nutrition and you know, having access to your main basic need to live. Thanks, that's great. And and one of the things, I mean, because it's one of the, you know, I, I think we all have a good handle on the idea of food security, but food sovereignty was one of the, those things that I had to go and kind of look up and go, what does that mean? And and then um, one of the things that I was just struck by that, that comes up in various definitions is that it's um, the right to define our own food and agricultural systems. Um, so that kind of that that sovereignty of you know having a say in your own local systems and um, even in the um, in so. 2000, 2008, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development, who were under the sponsorship of um, the United Na Nations and the World Bank, they adopted the following definition. Food sovereignty is defined as the right of peoples and sovereign states to democratically determine their own agricultural and local policies. Um, and I just think that's... Um, so there's, there's the questions as well of, you know, of as you say, nutrition being part of. It's not just about, you know, calories. It's also about is the, is the food... Um, is it healthy? Is it culturally appropriate? Is it nutritious? Um, and also, are there kind of ecologically sound, and sustainable methods? But also that question of of um, of of control and choice. And I think that brings us back to the the question of the of the some of the free trade agreements. Um, and Ross, you might um, at this point just kind of give us a little bit of of an overview of what you think are the main concerns from a food point of view, food and farming point of view, of some of those free trade agreements. Um, well, I mean the. 
in, in particular, uh, TTIP, uh, I mean, TTIP is an absolutely enormous uh, trade agreement. It's the, the biggest ever on the planet. So it covers a multitude of areas. Um, it, but Ireland is going to be significantly affected around food. Essentially, in you know very simple terms, what the trade is a trade agreement between Europe and the United States of America, and it is an uh, it's the plan is to um, equalize standards across both countries to make it easier for uh, businesses in one country to import and export etc between the two. So you know it sounds fairly reasonable. Um, the, the, the problem is that we in Europe have a very different view of how we manage uh, standards. Um, we have the precautionary principle. So you have to prove that something isn't poisonous before you can put it into food. In America, it's the other way around. You have to prove that it's harmful. So they, you know, roughly speaking, the term they use is like end of pipe. So, so they don't have quite the same view on quality of um, uh, food, foodstuffs coming from farms. Kind of doesn't really matter too much what it's like because when it gets to the end of pipe process, they kind of blast. They can blast it with various chemicals and stuff to clean it up. We're much more interested in the watching the standards all the way from the farm all the way along until it reaches your your plate. So that would be an area in general terms where the United States negotiators want that scrapped and to that we would meet their standards rather than the other way around. There is it, It's highly unlikely that they are going to introduce the high standards that we have around food. So the sorts, sort of things that we, we don't have in Europe at the moment are hormone-treated meat, uh, cloned cattle, GMO, and a whole plethora of chemicals that they use in food production that we don't have. We don't have them in Europe at the moment. And that is because of our precautionary principle. We will lose that proportionate precautionary principle if the TTIP agreement gets through. So that's a very roughly speaking. I mean, there's a hell of a lot more. And as you know, I could just keep talking, so I won't. <laughs> okay. Um, I suppose one of the things I want to, to, to look at as well is the, the thing that, that, that um, came, cropped up already about the nutritional kind of density of the food. Um, it, I suppose it's it's a... It's a given that it's not going to be the um, the primary concern of corporations that they have nutritious food. Okay, um, is it necessarily more of a concern for smaller producers or for small holders? And and Rose, you might come in on this, but Ross, you might you might have a response to that. Just very quickly on that, the whole interesting thing around food international food exports. I mean, I think it's probably slightly different with what you might call dry goods. I don't know. I don't know if you like coffee being called a dry good, but um, for example, perhaps you're really really concerned about uh, organic food consumption maybe you've a hundred percent organic diet and you always buy organic but if your organic food has come from halfway around the planet its nutritional density has been reduced by up to 70 percent and actually you're better off buying local food that is not organic than to buy uh, organic food that's been flown halfway across the world even leaving aside its environmental impact on it being flown around the world so there are Again, more reasons why you should be consuming fruits and vegetables from your local region because actually they're more nutritionally dense. Okay, um, Rose, would you have any any thoughts on you know that that question of does lo does producing food locally um, or does ha having food come from from small producers does that affect the, nu the nutrition quality of it as opposed to taking it from the corporations? Uh, well. If the food comes from a local area, you're going to be eating it a lot fresher, so it's always going to be more nutritionally valuable. And the other thing you don't have to feel too guilty about is you haven't transported a load of water across the world. Somebody else's water, and water is a huge issue in farming globally now, and the new silver bullet is irrigation, but of course there isn't enough water in rivers in places like Zimbabwe to do irrigation, so that means you know we try to encourage agriculture that um, involves um, polycultures and involves trees and shade and getting lots of organic matter into the soil. I've gone off on a little tangent here, but I actually, I want to dare to go into another little tangent because uh, if, if trade agreements are one thing, aid agreements are another thing that are very, very scary. 
And when when aid and business or aid and private um, PPPs, public-private partnerships, whatever, are mixed up, you're really into territory where it's very hard to actually even see what's going on. One of the examples of, of an aid agreement, um, which happened, I think it's 2008, but I may not be correct on this one, it's called the Global Alliance for F Food Security. And that involves um, uh, governments, uh, including Ireland within the EU bloc, making agreements with countries like Ethiopia and Malawi, whereby they have this framework where they, they've got to agree to do X, Y, and Z, and then they will get you know, food aid and, aid and there'll be support for um, <laughs> um, providing inputs like fertilizer and chemical fertilizer and Roundup to farmers. So this is the kind of deal, but th those, uh, there, there are four things, and I can remember three of them right now, that those two countries had to agree to in or order to be members of this alliance for food security. One was that they had to allow exports of their main staple crops, uh, like a country like Malawi, because it had experienced droughts, had had put in a moratorium on exporting maize in order to make sure there was enough in the country. So, uh, and then the other thing was uh, they had to allow patent, seed patent laws to come in, which would mean that small farmers would be restricted from saving their own seeds, trading seeds between each other and all of that. And the third thing was that they had to put aside large tracts of land for uh, multinational agri investors. And I can't remember the fourth one, but it's probably just as horrible. <laughs> so, um, bring me back to that question. Again, okay, well, I, 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 was, I was asking, does local food, in, and in the case of, you know, in developing countries like Uganda and Tanzania, mm. does producing food locally mean that, um, and, and not being um, dependent on, on corporations and on, on large um, organisations, does that, does that produce more nutritiously <coughs> dense food? Or is there, any, is, there any, is there a benefit in terms of the local production of food? Well, absolutely. I mean, th basically, the most efficient food producers in the world are the small farmers everywhere in the world. And most of the farmers in the world are small farmers, less than two hectares. Even in, in the States, the majority of the farmers are family farmers and they're small farmers. So, um, uh, are they? <laughs> I think the issue about nutritional is about having a diversity, and having rotations, and having healthy soil. Um, and generally, when corporations are involved, you're talking about large tracts of land, you're talking about big machinery, and you're talking about monocultures. So um, you're also talking about mining the fertility of the soil in favour of just using the soil as like a place to stick plants, and then you pour loads of chemicals on and you produce food. So, yeah, um, I, I'm finding your question a little bit difficult to, to attach to, but maybe that answers it to some extent. Okay, great. Um, absolutely. Well, I, m maybe at this point we, we might take take a break and, and put it out to the audience um, to maybe discuss amongst yourselves. So if you could break into groups of, of three or, or four or two, whatever works for you there, um, and just have a chat about um, some of the questions that, that you have, have, have been raised for you in listening to the speakers. Um, and maybe then we could take a few questions from the floor. So we'll take a break of five minutes or so. Yeah. Okay, super. Thank you. And we shall be back to you about what people can afford and just ask people to swap one or two things out. Um, you know, I, I, even the Sheridan brothers, that's something that they've been saying for a long time. They don't expect people to be buying their cheese all the time because they know it's not cheap, but to buy it sometimes. So I think it's a commitment about getting people to swap one or two things uh, items uh, out of their basket. Norman, would you agree with that or, or would you have a different stance on it? No, I would agree. At, um, I mean, one of the issues we have is that we try and source locally and we talk to local farmers and scale is an issue. You know, mega, you know, agribusiness produces on a fantastic scale. Most organic producers produce on a small scale. We've got suppliers from Europe, from Holland and France and Spain, where organic pr uh, produce is more established which is cheaper, which is producing a better deal for our members. Um, but then we're not supporting local Irish producers. So we have to make a balance between sort of the cheapness and the, the price to the consumer 
and the long-term interests of agriculture within Ireland. So that, that is a balance. Um, perception is an issue. Supermarkets have managed to spin this line that organic is a premium product. It's not always. It doesn't always have to be more expensive. Many uh, sort of basic produce lines like um, green beans and peas and what have you, those, your legumes, they can be produced organically just as quickly, just as cheaply as non-organic um, ones. So we need to bust the myth there. And the third one is that we have to consider the total price. As Ross said earlier, food industry dumps its costs on the health service. So the health issues, people talk about the costs of looking after elderly people, the costs of looking after sick people, the problems of obesity. Where are these problems coming from? They're coming from the fact that you can buy four beef burgers in a frozen packet for less than a euro. What on earth did people think they were buying? You know, you've got to get across to, to the ordinary consumer that actually it's a bit of a fool's paradise and there needs to be a bit of a reality. And the media, food writers, TV, um, papers, magazines have got a crucial role to play in changing the perception. Rose, as somebody who's been involved in organic crop research and and also the or organic certification body do you have any thoughts on, on on that yeah i'm going to be a bit glib but the first one is grow it yourself <laughs> there's loads of land in ireland that's just growing grass that people don't even use as a place to play or sit on because they don't get any sun so uh, grow it yourself have a look around i mean there and there are lots of of initiatives that are worth joining like the gorilla gardening in cork i've heard cork university students have been doing that but also um these um you know there are two csas in the world one is the uh, community supported agriculture and that's the one i'd like to promote there's another one called climate smart agriculture which is actually quite climate silly agriculture but it's one of those greenwashed things just like Origin Green from Ireland at the Expo in Milan, where we served uh, beef burgers and chips. That was the only menu at the Irish Expo stand in Milan. You know, sad story. But anyway, grow it yourself. Join the the uh, a C, uh, uh, or form a community a supported agriculture movement. That's what I would say. And you know, get out there and, and visit organic farms and see how you can support them or how you can make a direct link to getting baskets of food. And uh, I think there are um, such schemes where, like, you pay 100 euros in the year and you get X amount of food, you get a chance to go and help grow the stuff or just enjoy the butterflies going around in the farm or whatever. So, yeah. Omar, as a producer um, who introduced organ <coughs> organic certification uh, to your co-op, um, what what would your thoughts be on this in terms of that that the, the added cost of organic uh, produce? Mm -hmm. uh, just to, to add uh, to the question that that, that they have, um, I think one of the and the um, uh, is issues that we have in, in Honduras is the technology. So technology. For us, is um, I mean, we are always trying to to create uh, things, which is good. Trying to find a way to 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 get a solution for problems, but um, we lose a lot of time, and uh, that we need is knowledge, knowledge that came from from these countries, for example, that uh, give us a solution on uh, how fertilize and get more production from organic. So now we are basically like all manual, you know, it's, it's good all in the same way, but because we get uh, jobs, but, uh, but it's not efficient. So that means that organic is, uh, the cost is higher for us because, uh, I mean, the farmers, you, you, you cannot say only, okay, you have to grow organic and then, okay, but what is the, the product that we apply? What is the product that you give me or... Or what is the way to produce uh, this product to spray in, in my farm, foliar or solid uh, fertilizers? So I think uh, a lot of help for, for, I mean, many countries around the world that don't have this kind of technology that you have here, maybe uh, to produce organic uh, products, can help a lot. And also can be a market also for, 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 for these products. Because uh, 
one of the things that uh, damage, uh, I mean, the, the market of organic in our countries is the cost. The cost is very high. Even when we have all the waste that we process, for example, in coffee, we process all the pulp, all the mucilage, and we put in the farm. But it's not efficient in terms of uh, the percentage of nutrients that have to have to uh, feed the plant. So, and then you have another balance when, when you do that. So I think that can help a lot and then reduce the cost and then we can sell for less price or organic products and that can be affordable for you here. So, and um, just, uh, I don't want to forget that part because I heard the, the volunteer part. Uh, for Capucas was very important uh, that a lot of people came and give knowledge uh, and, and uh, share knowledge with us. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, okay. about uh, just money. It's a thing that uh, if you know something that we can apply, so you can go to Honduras and you can uh, stay there two weeks uh, with a specific mission. That helped a lot. We we was part of the program Farmer to Farmer. So we bring some farmers uh, from U.S. and also from Europe that they came and they have a specific uh, task, like let's say, okay, marketing, uh, um, diversification, things like that. So that help a lot because, uh, I mean, in our countries that happen is that. I mean, we don't have all the knowledge so uh, to, to create things or to, to do these things uh, faster mm -hmm. and to, to get that, uh, that market. I, I remember that the first uh, volunteer that we get was uh, Rick Pizer from, from Green Mountain. And he helped us to to get in a fair trade system because we don't know about that. And there are more producers that they don't know anything about fair trade. So it can be like, uh, why not? But it's, it's like that. Some, sometimes people, they don't, they don't know that there's, there are uh, these kind of opportunities. Yeah. And I think that point about about knowledge sharing is yeah. is kind of a, applicable here as well. You know, um, you speak to a lot of or organic farmers here, and and for them, it's a long learning process. Um, where really, you know, twenty years into being organic, they're kind of learning how how to do it better, um, and how to pass on the the the, the benefits and and and, re and reduce the costs and so on. Have we another question from the audience? I might come back to your second question in in, in a minute if I if I could, but we might take a, a question from elsewhere in the audience if we have one. Yeah, hi, and again, if you could just try and speak so that the people at the back of the room can hear you also. Okay, um, and as as you say, France has been very yeah. pro proactive um, in that kind of legislation. Would anyone like to take up on that, um, Ross? Well, or I can or speak to it a little bit, and like, do you, unless you want to. It very often starts with just looking at your own procedures and you know going the extra mile to make sure that you know if you bring into uh, bring into play um, a, a more environmentally sound system which costs a bit more, then you do that. I mean, most of our food surplus, um, some goes to homeless shelter, some is when the rest is basically composted. There's very little thrown away in, in, in the sense of like going to landfill or anything like that. So again, it's building the systems which you know, meet your values. Ross, do you yeah, do you have any um, anything to say on the on the kind of governmental policy? Yeah, uh, oh, Mark. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's uh, the the thing is that the, the state has stepped back a lot around. You know, we're we're in a neoliberal world now, and the state doesn't really intervene uh, 
that much uh, or as much as we wanted to. And uh, we j there is another element of the um, of TTIP that kind of relates to this, which is uh, the ISDS, or the Investor State Dispute Settlements. So basically what this means is that if we introduce environmental legislation such as that, say we did get our state to do to introduce legislation around food waste, um, then a, a country outside of Europe could sue Ireland um, because we have environmental legislation that's a barrier to, to their trade and to their profits. So they're, what, what, what's happening is it's compounding and kind of freezing legislation. People are, uh, governments are becoming more con less likely to legislate around environmental and welfare issues if they feel that they're going to be sued at some later date um, because of the, 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 the treaties that, they have, uh, that they've signed. I mean, a really good example in Ireland would be that very progressive legislation that we have around uh, pa um, uh, cigarette packaging. Um, and th there is the very serious threat that the Japanese uh, tobacco company are going to sue Ireland or, um, over that, and it's already taken place in other countries around the world. So, you know, there's a bigger overarching uh, issue here around environmental legislation that we, I am sure we would all love to see introduced. But a lot of that is going to be at risk under CETA and TTIP. Um, and just to add on that, um, uh, one of the a great initiative that that is taking place that is um, at more of a grassroots level initiative. Um, some of you will f be familiar with it, but the Be a Food Initiative, based down in Cork, um, which are which is a redistribution centre. So they are linking up. The likes of of Tesco or the or these companies that have surplus food, um, they can bring the surplus food in bulk to this redistribution centre, and then that can then be redistributed to charities. But that's not on a governmental policy level. Did you want to come back yourself there? Yeah, because if it's not at the government or the state level, it cannot be rights based. So if we talk about rights rights based in different countries, it's a different Okay, thank you. Have we another question from the audience? Yes. Can I just, in response to that, there's a, also a very good charity called uh, Food Cloud. Yes. They've yes. only been set up in the last few years, and they have successfully linked <coughs> uh, shops and businesses such as Tesco's and yeah. small cafes with charities, and they do it all through the cloud. They can send a text message for food that's not quite, just at its best before date, that would be thrown out at the end of the day, but if you and to my knowledge they work quite closely with um, be a food initiative um, the the difference in their their, their approaches being that uh, the, the the redistribution center allows them bring food in bulk and then distribute it to different charities so if there's too much to go directly to one charity and they're also able to, they're able to store it there they're able to chill it and so on um, but yeah those two are doing doing fantastic work have we another question for the panel hi I feel like I've hugged the space here a little bit, but um, I've strong views uh, on this. I don't. I don't believe that we can compete internationally with the mega farms of China and and America. Um, at the moment, uh, one in five children in the developing world are fed on powdered milk formula from Ireland. I don't think that's something to be proud of. Meanwhile, Irish Aid spent, I think, three million last year or the year before trying to educate women in the developing world to breastfeed their children within for the first six months at least, if not a year. So we're all over the place morally uh, on, on that. Um, secondly, I don't... Uh, I, do, I don't believe that our the farming sector should be going down that route, partly because we can't compete internationally, but mostly because we should be going towards the other end of the spectrum. The demand for organic produce across Europe is has gone up, I think, threefold in the last 10 years, but this changeover is lagging way behind. So there's a whole market area there that we could be chasing that we're not. Um, at the top, and I'm sorry to, I know you don't like to, to 
d- describe it as that. But, you know, it is at the top end of the food uh, sector, really. And that is where we need to be placing ourselves internationally as a small country with a rich land um, for, uh, for our exports rather than racing to the bottom, which is what, in my view, is that pol- is what that policy is doing. Yep. Sorry, you just used the phrase I, I was going to use there exactly, race to the bottom. The whole capitalist system is engaged in a race to the bottom, lowering wages, improving prices, lowering quality. The sort of agriculture that Simon Coveney is talking about is sort of non-organic, mass-produced, low value. The farmers don't, you know, they're, they're talking about the prospects for the milk market. The farmers don't see it that way. They're not getting the price for the pint that they, they feel that they ought. Many milk farmers are losing money on milk. So to say, right, we're losing money on this product, let's double our output, how does that work? So we're going to lose twice as much? You know? it's um, And at the end, it's going to come round to the tax system to subsidise the farmers to produce loss-making milk for other countries. And are other countries then going to subsidise the welfare system in Ireland to complete the circle? Of course they're not. So you have to think very carefully about you know, what you're actually producing. Only 1% of, of agriculture in Ireland is organic. That's the future. It provides more jobs, it provides better food, and it, uh, it provides more food security. OK. Have we another question from the audience? Uh, yes. Well, it, just, uh, I want to, uh, my name is Adi serious but very serious to, uh, uh, topic. I'd like to share some uh, uh, coffee anecdotes with you. It's not uh, too long. Uh, as you know, I mean, I actually de- uh, retold uh, the legend of the dancing goat. And um, the, the Middle East was particularly uh, a region where they, uh, I mean, they actually gave us coffee as we know it today. And um, uh, this is in 1554, coffee became the favorite drink at Constantinople and robbed the mosques of their worshippers to the disgust of the priests who swore by Allah that the roasted berries were the cause of the evil one and as such must be outlawed. To please the priests, it was uh, taxed, but it was drunk copiously in secret, then openly again. Refusing to supply a wife with coffee was a valid cause for divorce. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> When it came to Europe then, again the craze, and this just two chapters. How Monsieur Grevy got a pure cup of coffee. In spite of the fact that the French first civilized and glorified coffee to its present high state of perfection, it is nevertheless true that these people adulterate the beverage to a great extent. Chicory, especially, is used freely in that country. The reason for it is given by some that a majority of French coffee drinkers prefer it with a dash of chicory to give the drink tone and body. Others claim that the large consumption of chicory in France is due to a native habit of economy so characteristic of that nation. Be that as it may, however, chicory is a recognized accompaniment to coffee there. Apropos of this, the following story told of the late Monsieur Grevy is very retelling. Some years ago, he and a friend, Monsieur Bertmont, were among the guests of Monsieur Denier, the chocolate manufacturer, at a hunting party. When they started to re- return from the hunt through the forest, Monsieur Grevy and his friend became lost and trying to get their bearings fell upon a small wine house in their path. Tired out, they stopped for rest and refreshment. They called for something to drink. One was brought, which Monsieur Bertmont found to his taste. As Monsieur Grevy did not like wine, he asked for coffee. He was suspicious, however, that the decoction which would be served him might not be pure, so he managed in this way. Have you any chicory? He inquired the innkeeper. Yes, Monsieur. Bring me some. The writer returned with a small can of it. Is that all you have? Asked Monsieur Grevy. We have little more, Monsieur. 
Bring me all you have. Another can was brought in. Is that all? Yes, monsieur. Very good. Now go and make me a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that nice diversion. Um, do you have a, have a question on, on coffee for, for Omar? <laughs> or, or no, actually, I don't have coffee, but uh, okay. Rose, um, uh, you were in uh, uh, Tanzania, <laughs> and I know they, they do brew coffee. But <clears throat> I, I read some time ago, uh, I think it was Herbert Girardet, he wrote about the Chaga, mm -hmm. who practiced agriculture. I mean, when you arrived there, like, uh, did you uh, uh, like meet them and then like, what, what's your, you know, Would you like to use the microphone? I think you're asking me about the agroforestry systems in the Chaga That's region. Yeah, the Chaga, because... Yeah, uh, at the foot uh, of Kilimanjaro. Yeah. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, in this whole kind of dominant uh, paradigm of monoculture and um, the, the Green Revolution and promoting um, monocultures in countries like Tanzania, um, at least some of the researchers were going and talking to farmers and the, they wrote up uh, descriptions of the, the Chaga home garden systems. And it was absolutely fascinating. But of course, it, I mean, it got recognised, but not really promoted everywhere in, in the highland, similar highland areas around the country. And it's situations like you get in the coffee forests in... Um, Central America, where you have like 100, maybe 120 species growing in one hectare. And you're standing there and you're just quite amazed that the farmer has uh, something to either eat or sell every day of the year. So it's seasonal, continuous production rather than just harvesting once one crop once in the year, or maybe if you have two seasons, two seasons in the year. And that, Adekunle, are you from Zimbabwe originally? <laughs> yeah, I think I met you so many, many yeah, many I years did, ago. Okay, because um, in in Zimbabwe recently, I travelled with with uh, my colleague Nelly, uh, who's Maonde, who's an agriculturalist there, and uh, you know we were searching for um, sustainable agriculture uh, examples that we could promote and say, you know, this is what we want to help. Uh, farmers to do and we traveled through this area and it was um the it had been not a total drought but not a very good season in terms of rain and we passed one field where oh the maize was more or less dead and obviously they had hardly anything produced and then we just stopped and there was a hedge around we went in and we met miss mrs gava and she put us sitting down under a guava tree as it happened and there were avocados and there were pigeon peas and there was just loads and Nellie sat down under this and the woman was telling us about how she saved her own maize seeds and how she had uh, leguminous trees for um, fertilizing the land and they only had about three acres but she sat there and she says to me as she was chewing on the guava this place oozes food security <laughs> and you know it was just a wonderful moment and I had the very same feeling in a field in El Salvador where the rainfall was 300 millimetres that's very little rain if you have a lot of evaporation and it was about 1300 um, metres above sea level and Nicar or El Salvador in, in, in Central America is probably going to move out of the, the zone where coffee can be grown because it doesn't have enough highland that will still stay uh, moist and cool. Uh, but anyway, this, this was uh, a woman called Karen, I think, and it was just fascinating uh, to look on the ground. Oh, if this was X weed, but no, we eat that uh, for dinner. It's a green. We get the salad off that. There, was, there were these wild limes that were native to the area. And she was telling me this was her coffee field, and you could hardly see the mm -hmm. coffee because the coffee was recovering from the rust, which has threatened the coffee um, production in Central America. And then she appears with this basin full of honey oh man i mean this is what this is heaven this 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 is where you know what we should be striving for mm. and well i think about that in the temperate zone and i think about my woodland in south galway which didn't flood um and you know to have 
to have things at all the different layers <coughs> where photosynthesis can take place and where you can trap the light. You, you can do something like that in Ireland as well. But now I just want to say one thing about the physical, sorry, the sure. physical inability to be able to have 300,000 more cows in Ireland. I mean, if Simon Coveney came to the top of the M18, which isn't finished, to the top of it's at Gort, and you look out on Gary Land and Cool Park, and it's completely flooded. And in the middle of it is this fabulous big cattle shed, marooned. And this guy is telling us we can fit more cows in Ireland. The farms have been flooded, not just with water, but the slurry out of the slurry tanks. Mm -hmm. And they're still flo flooded and people still can't get back into their homes. I mean, you're talking about climate chaos and people are talking about adding to the chaos. It's mm -hmm. completely ludicrous. Okay. Thanks. Good, good point and well made. Um, I, I just think that's a really interesting image um, of the, the oozing food security because to me, it's when you said that, it struck me that when you think of food security, there's something kind of arid about that about that term and it's it's almost like it's defined by the the insecurity that you're keeping at bay it's like food security is about just enough as opposed to being about ample or you know abundance which the word ooze suggests it's like more than enough you know and it just yeah it it, it, it was a very interesting kind of phrase um i just like to 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 to, to bring omar back in um in terms of you mentioned a little bit about the biodiversity, but I think it's a really interesting thing. You might just tell us a little bit more. I mean, there's there's um, organic honey that you're producing. There's mm -hmm. fruit and vegetables. Um, so maybe just tell us about why you why you felt it was so important to have those that diversification and what it's done for your your output. Yes, for us it's very important because uh, I mean to to to, to f food security first, but also to to give extra incomes. So uh, we begin with the bees. Bees, uh, as you know, are in danger now the, around the world. Uh, a lot of uh, bees are dying because the chemicals. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, um, things that are sprayed. I mean, uh, pesticides. pesticides. Sorry. So uh, for us, it's very important because uh, it helps us to have more production also in the coffee plantation. And also we have a honey that it came from coffee flowers that we're trying to marketing uh, as that. So and and also we find a market with that that um, you know small roasters or people that buy our coffee say okay I want that also that that honey because it came from coffee flowers and we actually found that have caffeine also so it's it's, oh. it's very good. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> and then. And then we're trying to put, uh, I mean, uh, as much we can in the, the land because people don't have too much space. It's very small, so we put uh, lemongrass. Lemongrass helps to avoid the erosion, so it's very important for the soil. Uh, and also, there are a market for that, uh, for, mm -hmm. for make tea. And, and then all the fruits that we have, we're trying to dry and sell as uh, uh, dry fruit in the market. So, so it's, what, it's, what kinds of fruits? Uh, we have citrix, uh, we have... Uh, um, Pineapple, uh, papaya, mango, uh, guayaba, a different kind of, of fruits that we can dry and also make a tea with that. So it's, it's, it's another thing that we that we have. And also the ornamental plants that uh, in the same time that the farm looking uh, looks very nice, you know, flowers and, and, and ornamental plants. So also have a market in, in Honduras, you know, for, for, mm -hmm. for office and for home. So uh, these kind of, of products that in the end we can uh, use it and sell it in the, inter in the inter internal market and uh, uh, give extra income for the... So it's extra the income as well as being yeah, bi also biodiversity. Passion fruit, passion fruit, the flowers, we are drying also the flowers also to make tea. So... Yeah. Interesting um, theme of beverages here, you know, it's <laughs> teas and honey and, yeah. and so on. Great, thank you. Do we have another question from the floor? And um, we might come back then to, to the last question over here. It with Judith's question yeah. later on. Uh, Judith asked about how do you make organic food even cheaper. Mm. But even if you think about, I don't shop in the food co op, but uh, if you go to the uh, supermarket like Super Value, you can get six tomatoes for 99 cents from Holland. But if you want to buy Donnelly's tomatoes from Ireland that are grown in Ireland, you have to pay 269 And I, my, my values may be to buy the local one for 269 my budget 
is not mm. the local one to 269. When you consider all the different things you do, I, I think your point was swapping one or two items, and I do do that, and I might swap three or four items. But like, there, 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 like spoiling, the question is like, how can we make local food cheaper? Not necessarily organic choice. I said, it, local and organic would be ideal, but you know, it's like, how do you make local food cheaper? Like, Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of. Can I just? There's. Yeah. I, I live on North Strand actually, and just across from me is a is a community garden, and a few doors down is a is and there's a few cafes around there, and then there's also a grocer's. Actually, I, I'm not sure. I think I might have closed down. <laughs> anyway, um, but the point being that when I go over to the community garden, they have a glut of half a dozen things. You know, every year, you know yourself if you grow stuff, you get a glut of stuff, and they were like giving it away. They were, please take all these extra broad beans that we have. We don't know what to do with them. Meanwhile, there's a, a cafe 10 feet from them selling the most horrendous food that comes in from one of the big caterers. Uh, equally, the, across the road, there's a restaurant that should be delighted to get some of those broad beans and scatter them over some of the dishes. So like, but regulations make all of that extremely difficult. So they can't actually sell any of the vegetables from there. So there's a whole rethink needs to be done around our, our, our food supply. That's okay, I'll finish on that side. And just on that, actually, um, just, uh, yeah, I'll bring you, bring you in, Norman, but just, I just want to make uh, one point. Um, there's some interesting, um, one interesting case of, of a restaurant getting involved with um, direct, with locally grown food is um, Anir down in, sorry, I'm wrong, it's Loam down in Galway, um, which is End of McAvoy. And he is, he has links with local CSA schemes um, where they are, for example, they do, um, they work with a, with a local lady who um, brings a, a cocktail of the month onto the menu and they but they do they have a drop off point in the restaurant for the CSA scheme but also and um, they they use a lot of the produce so and um, there are there are little pockets of people doing interesting things Norman you wanted to come in CSA, sorry. sorry community supported agriculture am i right yes um another issue there is seasonality because as the local local scheme found in season crops are in abundance there's times of year when it's very, very difficult and consumers have grown to expect year-round um, produce, you know, year-round tomatoes. You know, you don't get tomatoes in Ireland in January, you know. So you have to, to an extent, educate the consumer, perhaps go back to looking at recipes and seasonal recipes, you know, stews in the winter and salads in the summer. You know, there's a reason it developed like that, because that's when the stuff was available. You know, and we have to think about back to the culture and think of what is Irish food culture. You know, people have been living here for thousands of years. You know, they've existed in a certain way because that was in harmony with the land. Okay, maybe we need to go back to being in harmony with the land and not expecting bananas and tomatoes in January. Yes. Point being is, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a grocer, you know, or community garden right in front of you, well, that's great. But you know, as many of you know, there's no such thing around near your area, so you end up in Dunn's or Super Value or Tesco, and that's why you're going to do your shopping. But you know, these places do not make it easy to get in, in touch with your local producer. It's near impossible as a as a normal person to to have access to. Sure, you wouldn't even know who's producing what near where you live. Um, what do you think could be uh, initiative could be supported to bring the farmers closer to the consumer? Because I mean, it's fine maybe if you live down in Kerry or I don't go to where maybe it's easy. But when you live in Dublin, in, in the middle of Dublin, uh, let's face it, I mean, you have no hope to get in touch with the, the farmer. So how do you get in touch with the farmer? Okay. Do do any of you have any res response to that? Uh, Norman, uh, you look like you do. Yeah, <laughs> at, at Dublin Food Co-op, we had small organic producers used to come in to the uh, co-op on a Saturday and sell direct to the members. And that was quite successful. Unfortunately, they've now all retired and we're now looking to replace them. But most of the small producers don't want to do the direct farmer's market thing anymore. They're quite happy to turn up drop off a load of uh, produce, pick up a cheque and go, but that's fine. But if you come to the co-op and look at 
what's available. A lot of what we stock now is is uh, local and Irish. Mm-hmm. So I mean, how do you break that? You know, I mean, that's, where, that's how yeah. consumer can support local... Yeah, sure, sure. So Ross uh, might come in uh, on this. J- j- well, for, first, just to very quickly answer your question, if you go to the Meeting House Square Farmer's Market on a Saturday morning, Jenny McNally is there every weekend with a huge display of the most fantastically fresh produce that she's grown on her own farm in North County, Dublin, I think it is. Mm-hmm. So you can meet her on Saturday morning if you want to go and have a chat with her there. Uh, sec- the second point to make is uh, this, the supermarkets, and you know, I have an interest in one of them because I do some work for Super Value, but the, the supermarkets have you duped into thinking that you, you, you can get everything there. You, a, you can't, and B, it's not cheaper. And I, I promise you, if you go and visit Jenny McNally, you will find a ton of amazing uh, salad ingredients that are often cheaper than the supermarket. So, and then finally, just to say to you, join a uh, Grow It Yourself organization or set one up yourself locally. And also just to go back, I mean, um, Rose did, did mention earlier on the community supported agriculture uh, schemes that that allow um, you to. So instead of the old kind of box delivery scheme, the idea is that you go and you do a little bit of work. You have that kind of direct um, connection and then and then you get some of the, 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 the produce then as a result of it. So I suppose there are ways. Yes. Did you want to come in? Okay. Uh, and I don't know of any other, uh, I don't know about the other Tesco's or I know that they, 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 they as well as doing something very, you might say, um, environmentally and food friendly there, they propose the Tesco's of Bally Mons, which is so it's, so they have their, they, 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 they pick and choose where they, where they, where they want to be, um, socially conscious. Sure. Yeah. What area is that out of interest? Uh, it's uh, at Cabra Cross. It's okay. At, uh, Okay. Uh, and presumably that comes from a from a demand from the well, customer the, base. The, the actual Tesco produce, promote, produces more uh, energy than it actually consumes, and it has a hundred art, artisan right. products. Okay. Um, I'm going to take um, one last question. I did promise that I would go back over to the corner here if you still wanted to to put that question. Uh, Does anyone? I know that Ross definitely has something to say on, yeah, on this. Um, but does anyone else want to go first? But like, the, the, the thi- I'm sorry, but the thing is, the doctors are trained to make us better, not to keep us well. So they are trapped in that mindset. So you know, when in the early days of the National Health Service in the UK, when it first was formed, it had two sides to it. It was about like keeping people well, but also treating the sick. And in the first cuts, it, the, the first half disappeared. So it's not the doctors that we need to be talking to because that's not their job. That's another part of the state's job to, to do that. So like, yes, absolutely. That's that's the answer. Is that we need to educate people that food is medicine. Um, but that's going to have to start right back at school. And it, mean, it means a radical change in how we've been behaving before. It means maybe creating a super department of education, agriculture and health. I don't know. But it means some really radical changes. Sorry, I'm really... And, and looking at, no. I suppose, the the, uh, the bigger long-term vision of investing money in education uh, in order to get so, the gains so, so, in, in yeah, so that you, so that But that means investing and big changes now so that in 25 years we've we've solved a big problem. 
but our governments don't work in 25 year cycles so it would take it's going to be a big ask i do think we can achieve it you can achieve you know 10 years ago people laughed at us in in marriage equality when we said we wanted equal marriage rights they laughed at us the politicians laughed at us who's laughing now so um so you know if we if we make a commitment and we agree and we work hard it's a long it would be a long long road but we could bring about change does anyone want to com come in on that as well or um we're just we're just at nine o'clock so i'd just like to um to to go back to um something i'd asked each of the the panelists at the beginning to think about um perhaps a question that they might put to you as the audience that you might take with you and have a little think about um after this this talk so um ross did you have have something that you wanted to leave with with the audience as a question they might take home with them um, or if there was one thing that that you that you wanted people to really just kind of to give a little thought and attention to I, well i just the one thing i would ask you to do is when you go home tonight or over the next few days is just to educate yourself just on one area of ttip it's huge pick one thing that you're interested in really really get to grips of it of it don't get sidelined know your stuff around that one thing and be confident in speaking in that area and speak to your friends about it and most importantly all the new tds that have just been elected are dying to hear from you <laughs> <laughs> okay great thank you omar did you have a question that you would like the audience to go home with tonight or something that you would like them to think about, to, to take home and think about? Uh, I think um, maybe I will disturb you with this, but um, in my village, in my town, we are strong believers in Jesus. So maybe that's another part that we, kept, we have to put uh, first. Um, I mean, we have a big discussion here about uh, many topics, but for us, for our community, the most important thing is the spirituality, and we feel comfortable with that, and we are strong believers on that, and um, we see the hands of, of him every time that we take a decision, because we take a decision based on that principles that you already have here in, the, in your community, but I think, um, I not judge, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's a personal relation. So develop that personal relation, so that could be my question tonight. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Norman, what about yourself? There's a question that can help you unpick any situation you'll meet in life. And that question in Latin is, qui bono? Who benefits? Okay, if you're puzzled as to why the Doyle has passed a crazy act, ask yourself, who benefits? Okay, and... F in the immortal words of the Watergate, follow the money. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, what, when you look at, so when you're doing your shopping, think who benefits. Mm. You know, my organisation represents the, con the consumer. Omar's organisation represents the, the producer. You know, if we can do business somehow, I'd love to. I'd love to have Omar's coffee ground, you know, either in Honduras or in Ireland and on our shelves, because that way we're cutting out the people who benefit at the expense of ill health, benefit at the expense of low wages, benefit at the expense of environmental degradation. So, simple question, qui bono? Very good, thank you. Well said. And Rose? I think it's about nourishment, and maybe it's about nourishing the spirit with positivity. And... Um, uh, I, I have several gurus in agroecology and they're all very nourishing if you just watch their YouTubes. Uh, people like Steve Gleesman or Miguel Altieri or Pablo Titanel or Van Danashiva. Go for them, you know, look at what they're saying. And then the other, you know, sort of positive thing to say is there is change in the air. The FAO that supported the Green Revolution and that you know, was so pro monoculture agriculture in 2014 held a symposium on agroecology, imagine, in Rome. And they promised at that that they would hel hold regional ones, and they've done it. You know, they did a regional one in, in uh, for Latin America, and they've done one in Africa. So, well, hey, you know, we're getting there somehow. And some of the um, 
the big uh, food producers are starting to get a bit worried as well. And, and they're also starting to be a bit more philanthropic towards agroecology. So there is an agroecology fund that people um, in developing countries can use to promote agroecology. Um, so go for it. Nourish yourself. <laughs> Nourish the world. <laughs> well, thank you for finishing us on that positive note. So thank you to you all for coming along this evening. Um, I hope that, um, th that some interesting questions were raised for you. I know there was so much that we didn't get to discuss because it was a rather enormous topic, but hopefully there was enough there for you to kind of, you know, to, to take home and to, and to maybe kind of follow through on some of the points. Um, did you want to make a quick point? There's a big uh, coffee-related event in Dublin uh, in June, the world of coffee. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So if you're interested in coffee, follow up on that. Thank you very much for coming along this evening. Just maybe you join me then in thanking our, our four panellists, uh, Rose, Norman, Omar and uh, Ross. And especially then Aoife, you did an absolutely brilliant job and just bring us all together tonight. And just yeah, great. Great. All good education involves some reflection, but critically some action. So tonight you've had lots of reflection, but if you go away tonight and do one or two things, there's plenty of suggestions there of things that you might take on. Uh, there's information about TTIP on the tables and also down the back. There's the food co-op that you should join. There's fair trade produce that you should be buying and plenty of other things. So um, great to have you tonight and we might see a future uh, co-op for some of the debates. And thanks again. Take care. Thanks very much. <laughs> It is a pleasure. Yeah, Thank absolutely, you. and you too. <laughs>